not dictated by a deity. It's developed from empathy, dependence, and love. My morality accepts everybody. Sexuality is more concerned with inequality and the validation from above. Set into stone tablets. Welcome to another episode of Nuns. We have today with us Lawrence Krauss. He is the author of A Universe from Nothing. He also is the director and founder of the Origins Project at Arizona State University. And he has a movie out now called The Unbelievers. First question I want to ask you is, uh, what level of audience are you writing your books toward? Advanced level? Lay people? Well, I'm trying to reach lay people. I'm trying to do my part to convey the wonder and beauty of what we've learned about the universe, which I think is some of the most amazing creative and cultural activities that humans have engaged in and that more people should appreciate. So I try and write for as broad a possible audience as possible. I don't know if I reach them, but I try. Do you consider yourself remediating a lot of people's gaps in physics? <laughs> I don't think that's possible. There are too many <laughs> gaps. Right. But what I want to do is provide people with just a new perspective and maybe a new motivation to learn about what's going on. What I am trying to do is maybe uh, surprise people and clear up some misconceptions about the universe, of course, that people mm -hmm. have, but mostly just to excite people and share my joy. You said that you write for lay people and you talk about some very, very advanced stuff. Do you have any like tips for other people who are trying to reach others and communicate these advanced ideas in a way that people can understand? Well, I often am asked about that and I often address teachers. I tell teachers that you know, when I'm asked to give an address on communicating, the biggest mistake any teacher makes is to assume their student serves did what they have to say. Once you do that, you're lost. But it's true not just for teaching, it's true for any activity. Writing, car salesman, anything. You have to convince people to be interested and so my advice is just to think about what questions interest people and go there and then use your own enthusiasms. Too many communicators, too many teachers are afraid to use their own knowledge and enthusiasms in the context of whatever they're talking about. But if people don't see why you're excited then it's hard for them to get excited. So I think thinking about the kind of questions people have and also remembering the things that people may or may not know which takes some experience, not falling into jargon to trying to think of how you first understood it yourself and explain it that way. That's the way I do think. That's an excellent approach. That's what well, I do. Physics is very heavy in jargon. So how do you get around that? There's a lot of background information and a lot of people have All scientific that. fields, all fields are heavy in jargon. But all those bits of jargon it succinctly describe concepts which you can describe without the jargon. And so um, it's just a matter of thinking, what are you, what are you trying to convey? and what are you trying to explain? Sometimes you have to talk about terms and sometimes it's, it's easy to forget that some people don't have, you know, understandings fall into certain concepts like a flat universe and then you realize you have to explain what a flat universe is. So constantly, I think questioning yourself in your explanations is the way to do it, but all jargon can be described, maybe less efficiently, but can be described in normal English. Now it's true that in physics, science, physics in particular is done mathematically, and therefore, whenever you convey it in words, there's something lost. And you should be honest about the fact that the description you're giving is not exactly true. But an analogy, I think the most important thing you can do when you're trying to communicate science is to not knowingly mislead. We all mislead at some level because we say things and people hear one thing when you say another. But not knowingly mislead. I think that's the important thing. You were talking at 3 OK this time about Plato's cave mm -hmm. and how it's difficult to even understand the universe because we have an obscure view of it or a hidden view of it. As a language arts teacher, I know that a lot of the words you use are, are an abstraction of the actual concept. So language itself is difficult a difficult way to describe the universe. A language is, yeah, language is, is, is you're, you're suffering when you use language. The language of nature appears to be mathematics. and. Anytime you use English or Chinese or French or German, you're at some level restricting yourself and you can't help but not get things exactly. And as I pointed out in the lecture, the history and progress of science has been realizing that our common sense is not something we can necessarily go by, that we, we do have a restricted view of reality and that science has, has increased the window on the universe and in so doing giving us a very different perspective, which is what I want to celebrate 
But at the same time, we have to realize that because that perspective is so different, that our common sense notions are limited in, in being able to explain that. One thing I have trouble understanding that you explain is with the Higgs boson, particles interact with the Higgs boson field, right? That's, I'm understanding that part. You're saying that these particles pop in and out of existence. Is existence the right word you're looking well, no, for? Well, that's a good point. Existence is kind of a vague notion. And when we talk in quantum field theory, in, in particle physics, we realize that objects that correspond to particles do pop into empty space and pop out of empty space in a time scale so short you can't see them. You measure space to be free of particles. There's nothing there. And classically, there's nothing there. But quantum mechanically, we realize that these there are these so-called virtual particles. And so when I say pop into existence, what I mean is that um, if they existed for longer, they'd be measurable as a real particle. Mm -hmm. But because they're, they're moving and uh, in space, but for such a short time and distance that we can never, in fact, by definition, we can never measure it, we can't really say with certainty that they're there. Because as Einstein pointed out, that reality is what we measure. And if okay. we can't measure it, it's not there. So like when it's interacting with the boson field, it, you were saying it has mass, but it, when it doesn't, it, it doesn't have mass. Well, it well no, no, I think you're confused there. The, 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 the Higgs field, as we understand it, exists and forms a background field like an electric field right. throughout the universe, but just one that is not so easily seen. But as particles move through it, they exchange, if you wish, they exchange virtual particles with it, which is how forces happen. They, they feel a force. Mm -hmm. They feel a force due to the presence of that background field. and it, restricts their motion. It adds a kind of inertia, like as I use the example swimming in molasses. Mm -hmm. When you're swimming in molasses, the particles of your body interact with the molasses and slow you down. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the particles that are moving, they experience a force through the Higgs particle by the exchange of virtual particles, which is how forces propagate mm -hmm. in nature. And that exchange produces some inertia. It slows them down. And certain particles interact with the Higgs field more strongly and therefore act more massive. And other particles don't interact at all. Well, certain particles like the photon don't interact at all, we think, mm -hmm. and therefore they're massless. And, and it's an amazing idea, and the fact that it, it seems to be true amazes me even more. Don't they exist even if they don't interact with the uh, Higgs boson? Well, the real uh, particles, like, I'm talking time? about real particles, not right. virtual particles. Real right. particles, the particles that make up your body and mine, mm -hmm. protons and neutrons, particles that are real. Mm -hmm. Real particles are ones you can measure that have properties you can measure. Okay. The virtual particles that pop in and out of existence mm -hmm. literally weren't there, literally weren't there. They weren't there, they suddenly appear, and they suddenly disappear. The but same so quick, particle? In, the in same, and out of the field? Well, the same type of particle, oh, like I an electron. Okay. You know, I mean, their electrons make up a body, but, but every, right now, in, in empty space on very small scales, electrons and their antiparticles called positrons are popping in and out of empty space. They, they literally weren't there before. They pop in, they're there for a microscopic time, and then they pop out again. If you try and measure and see what's there, you'll see nothing. It's, it's a weird concept, but, but that weird concept has mathematical implications which we can test. We can't see them directly, but we verify that they affect the properties of normal things, the particles that make you and I up, in a way that we can predict, and we compare that with the experiment and the prediction works out to be true to nine decimal places. Um, like you were saying with photons, they don't have mass either, Yes. but we can detect them and we can see them right now. And well, photons don't have mass because they don't interact with the Higgs field, right. but they're real photons, which we can see, I mean, and hopefully the camera can see, because it's working because of real photons, but there are virtual photons uh, that, 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 are, that you can't see, that, that in fact the force between two electric charges in modern quantum physics we say is due to the exchange of these virtual photons, which are, you can't see, but they mm -hmm. produce the force. They're different than real particles. That's why we call them virtual. I, I like real and virtual better than existent and non-existent. Okay, real particles and virtual particles. <laughs> well, I'm fine. Because, I mean, that, that's like kind of like that um, something from nothing and something had to make uh, yeah. appear. But that's that's the title of your book, something yeah, from nothing. Why is there something, the subtitle is Why is There Something from Nothing? Yeah. Right. And the point is we've realized that nothing is quite different than we thought before and so something. Our views have both have changed since the classical philosophers, and there's not such a difference between something and nothing. You can get something from nothing. You can get real from virtual, if you like those words better. <laughs> you were saying that the Higgs uh, was created at the beginning uh, when well, the this Higgs field. Expanded? Well, this Higgs field formed as the universe cooled down. At a very early time, we think, probably when the universe was um, less than a millionth of a millionth of a second old, 
We don't understand all the physics of the Higgs particle. There's a lot of questions we have. We've discovered it, apparently, at the Large Hadron Collider, but there are tons of questions we have about why it has the mass it has, why it sets the scale of the weak interaction, why, there are, why the forces are different. Every time we discover something in science, it leads to more questions, which is what makes it fun. A lot of people are upset by that, but that's the great thing about science. We don't claim to have all the answers. That's the fun. There's a lot left to learn. It's not like religion, where they claim to have all the answers before they even ask any questions. There's a lot of excitement around the Higgs boson uh, field discoveries, even mm -hmm. among lay people yeah. and non-science enthusiasts, which is what I would consider myself. I wouldn't mm -hmm. consider myself a professional. Mm -hmm. But even among average people, why should people be excited about it? Because at some level, it gives you a perspective on our origins. Everyone has asked the question in their own mind at some point, where do we come from, where are we going? And the purpose of art, music, literature, and science is to give us a new perspective on our place in the cosmos so we can understand ourselves better. The average person should be as excited about that as a, they are about a Mozart symphony or a rock concert or a beautiful piece of art. Part of the best about what's being human. Can scientists predict or have they discovered every particle, do you think, in the universe? No. There's, there's much more to be. We, we're sure there's much more we don't know about the universe than we do. That's why we keep looking. And every time we open a new window on the universe, we're surprised in general. I don't remember who someone said that because we know so much about particle physics, the, the likelihood of there being a God is less and less possible because we've identified many of the particles. Well, we've understood the history of the universe back to the earliest moments of the Big Bang, and we've understood how things form and, and how everything we see, as far as we can tell, arises. And so there's no, we understand the, the universe from microscopic scales to macroscopic scales, and there's no evidence of need for a supernatural shenanigan anywhere, so all it does is make God more irrelevant. Uh, they call the Higgs boson the God, God no particle. One call, no scientist calls no it the God one, particle. Right. Uh, really, if you, you're a theoretical physicist, what kind of particles would a God be? Uh, I have no idea. The I'm, same I'm as our particles, right? Well, I have no idea since I don't understand. I have no idea what God is. It's not something I worry about. That's the main point. Some people think that God is important, but it's not. Scientists never discuss it, because this God notion is completely irrelevant to everything we've learned about the universe. So you go to scientific meetings and the question never arises. So I have made no presumptions about something that isn't even well defined. Well, you're like me asking me what ghosts would be made of, but as far as I can tell, ghosts don't exist. So what would they be made of? Well, I can write a science fiction story, but it's all fabricated. Well, how do you think that the term God particle came about? I thought that was like an actual term for it. No, well, it was a friend of mine who's a very well-known physicist named Leon Letterman who wrote a book called The God Particle. Oh, he claimed he right. wanted to call the book The Goddamn Particle, but, <laughs> but it was a joke, and it was an unfortunate joke because uh, for some reason the, public, the journalists have picked up on it. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I saw the book around, and I thought, well, that's the, what no, the book's about, no, is this yeah. thing called The God no, Particle. No, 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 no one but Leon ever called it that and journalists now, and I wrote a piece for Newsweek after the Higgs was discovered and calling it the godless particle, because it, it, like all the rest of science, indicates that we're here by cosmic accident that we can try and understand. And therefore, the need for God, if there was ever one, at least from a scientific perspective, is less and less. Uh, it isn't so much there, I'm not asking that from a need for a God yeah, to explain anything, but if that something like that existed, it would have some kind of tool mark, some kind of... Uh, well, if God existed, you'd expect to be some evidence of God. Evidence. That's true. Yes. And we see no evidence. That's the point. Yes. Now, some people say you don't need evidence for God, and that's fine for them. But, to, but as a scientist, if something has an impact, it usually needs evidence. And, evidence. and it works pretty well to understand the universe. And we're doing a pretty good job of understanding it without God. And, and in fact, more importantly, many of the things that were attributed to God as evidence of God, we now know are nothing of the sort from storms and hurricanes to galaxies themselves. We don't need any supernatural hand to understand how those phenomena arise, and we just need the laws of nature. Um, a lot of people picture God as a kind of an anthropomorphic being with a hand, you know, yeah. like... Uh, Usually with, with a gray beard and, a, and yes. a male for some reason, except for the Greek gods who are more interesting. Right, and um, I know that you talked about Kenham in your, in your talk, uh -huh. and you have also talked to him on uh, O'Reilly and recently when the, when the Creation Museum first opened I yes. I did a sort of debate with him on, on the Bill O'Reilly show yes he's watched a few episodes mm -hmm. of our, of the nuns and he thinks it's ridiculous for us to say that we're apes or, and well we're animals. animals we're not apes I mean we're uh, not apes well no we're, we're, well, we're related to apes we have the same common ancestor that's the, one of the biggest mistakes about evolution that people like him and others purvey and I I remember 
speaking before the Texas State School Board on this, that it's not as if our ancestors were apes or, 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 or chimpanzees or whatever. We have a common ancestor with chimpanzees and with gorillas. We all have a co single common ancestor. We are animals and, we, and there's no doubt that we have connections with the other great apes. And you can see that from a genetic perspective in the nature of our DNA, the number of chromosomes. All of those predictions that say that we're related by, to a single common ancestor have been verified by genetics. But, Th but this, is a, this is a conversation that you and I need to have at some point. I argue that we are apes by definition. Hominoidea is ape. Hominidae well, is great ape. Well, well, we are a member of the family of great apes, but we are not gorillas. We are not chimpanzees. Oh, right. we're not. That's, but, but uh, I mean, I think the misconception that I was trying to get okay, at. You're either. absolutely right. We're a member of the same family. And therefore, we have close connections. But that's what it is. We are a member of the same family. And if you want to label us as a member of the family of great apes, that's fine. But I think it gives the, it feeds this misimpression that many creationists use that somehow, oh, well, you know, your grandfather was a chimpanzee. And right. that's not true. We're, it's not as if we evolved from chimpanzees. We have a single common ancestor with chimpanzees and gorillas. And, yeah. I didn't and want to jump into this, but this is a major point of my yeah. argument. Yeah. The definition of the humans are apes in the same sense that lions are cats and iguanas are lizards. Yeah, that's, I'll buy that. Anyway, okay. yeah, no, no, I mean, but the difference is there isn't such a emotionally charged language associated with that. So when you call tigers cats, people don't get the impression that you're saying a tiger is, a, is like your house cat. They realize it's a greater family. And I think we don't want to feed that misconception that people like Ken Ham feed off of is saying, oh, how could, you know, your grandfather be a chimpanzee and stuff, and and uh, and the point is that so that we are a member of the same family, we're related, and there's tons of genetic evidence that w could have been wrong, that's falsifiable, right. that demonstrates that in fact we diverged in lineage several million years ago, from uh, probably more than several million years ago, from other members of the great ape family. Yeah, I'm sorry that she sidetracked you into, yeah. into a different yeah. topic. Well, that's all. I think that's what you, how you want to end, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, are we done? Yes. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that was okay. awesome. Okay, good.